This video is the second part of a two-part video series, I guess you can call it, whereby we wanted to show how we can produce numerical solutions for the simple harmonic oscillator. Another way of thinking about it is how do we simulate it on computer. So in the previous video, and a link to that appears above, we showed a mathematical motivation for an explicit integrator that we would now like to implement, and I'm going to do it using Python. So this app that you're looking at is something called Sublime Text 2. It's a free download. They do ask you to register it, or though it's not necessary. And I'm going to use this to write Python code on my Macintosh computer. I'm running OS 10, and uh, Python comes built in in this case. If you're running Windows, go to python.org, and you'll see a free download and install for the Python interpreter. All right, so I like to start off just by putting in some comments. And first, we're going to set up our variables. Then we're going to define, this is an initial value problem, so we define something called our initial state, uh, the state of our initial variables, I, I mean our initial vectors, as well as our matrices. Um, then we want to implement a time-stepping solution. I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm pounding on my keyboard. I have a hypersensitive desktop microphone, and it should be mounted using a shock mount. And sometimes it just sounds like I'm banging on the keyboard, which I'm not. But uh, I apologize if it's distracting. So the idea is we set up our variables. We then set up the initial state vector and matrices. We perform a time-stepping solution and then plot the result. And we start off, like I do with everything numerical, in importing the NumPy library. I'll abbreviate it as MP. And this gives us a lot of functions to do with matrices and linear algebra and things that we would typically, typically use in solving such a problem. All right, so setting up our variables, the first thing I want to do is set up our mass, M. Remember, this is just a simple harmonic oscillator. It's a mass spring damper system. So I'm just arbitrarily going to set my mass to 2. I'm not even going to declare the unit. I'm just calling it 2. Same thing with my stiffness of my spring. I'm going to call that 2. And then initially, I'm going to call the damping just 0. I'm going to put in 0 damping while I try to get my simulator working and uh, the appropriate time step for it. And then I'll come back and we can run some damping problems. So I should mention, the first part of this video, I'm going to just set up the simulator. And then in the later half of the video, what I'll do is run some, uh, some examples uh, of some solutions that already we have looked at in previous videos. So this will be a way of simulating the results that we know to be true in a previous video. And by doing that, we're able to test or benchmark our, our simulator. Um, I should also mention, I'll just do this by way of a comment, that for critical damping, we know that this is equal to the square root, let me write it like this, it's, it's 2 times the square root of mk, m times k, which in this case would just be equal to, excuse me, 2, not 2, 4, my bad. m times k is 2 times 2 is 4, square root of that is 2, times 2 is 4, so for critical damping, c should be 4.0. I'll leave that in there. Um, we're going to assume that the amplitude of our forcing function for now is zero because we'd like to look at the free vibration problem initially. Uh, we'll then pick a time step, delta t, and just for argument's sake, I'm going to make that 0 0.1, one tenth of one second for now. Omega, which is the natural or the frequency of the forcing function, I'm just going to set to one for now. It's always good practice if you don't know a certain constant, you can just set it to one and change it later. And then I would like to work out my time steps. So I'm going to define, it's really a list. Um, and I'm going to use the NumPy function called a range on this, which is similar to Python's range, range function. But the range function only handles integers. This will handle real numbers or floats. So I want to run my time from a starting point of 0, ending but not including 20 seconds. and it will be delta t, the time interval. So I'd like to create a set of times beginning at 0, ending at 20, with the increment of delta t, which is our time step. Um, then let's define our initial state. 
Our initial state can be defined, we'll call the vector y, which is our, just our state vector, and we'll do this in the form of a NumPy array. Excuse me. Oh, my typing today. NumPy array. And initially, we'll just call it 0, 1. And I remind you that this vector is looks like velocity displacement. Velocity displacement. So I'm suggesting initially the velocity is 0 and the displacement is 1. And if this is a little confusing, it's probably beyond the scope of this class. But in NumPy, when we define an array, we create a list inside of the parentheses. In other words, we take a list and we feed it into this NumPy array function and we create a vector that way. So think of y as a vector, but we've initiated using it a list as list 0, 1. Not initiated, initialized it, I should say. Um, then our A matrix, uh, simply from the last video, we defined it as the following matrix. Again, we use lists. So we say it's a list of two lists. Each one of these lists, these inner lists, represent a row. So the first row is M0. M, M and then 0 is the second element. And the second row is 0 and 1. Okay, similarly, B is equal to NumPy array. Whoops. And again, it's a list of lists. And the first uh, row is C and K. And the second row is minus 1 and 0. There's no mystery here. This is straight a follow straight on from the previous video where we derived this. And then finally, we'll create a force vector, which we define as NumPy array again. And in this case, we're passing in just a single list because it's a vector, not a matrix. And we'll call that 0 and 0. And I'm actually going to put these in as reals. Technically, these should all go in as reals, but uh, actually NumPy converts them. I don't need to put 0, 0.0 in here, but I just like to do it for the case of my forcing vector. It's probably not necessary. <clears throat> now what I want to do is implement the time-stepping solution. So I will loop through my times and my time steps for, time, for t and time. Whoops, take that out for t and time. What do we want to do at each time step? Well, the first thing we want to do is we want to calculate uh, f. And in this case, it's, remember that f is a vector with two elements. The forcing function comes in here at this top element. So initially, I'm just going to define it as 0 as a placeholder. And now I want to replace it with the actual force. I remind you that initially, I've set the force magnitude to 0. But let's just say, for example, this were 1. I'll go back and I'll change it later. And mind you, this is probably a good time to save this. I'm just going to call this single degree of freedom simulator.py. Okay, so going back for time and time, first thing that we want to do is we want to create what does the forcing function look like at that time. And the forcing function is element zero, the first element, which is element zero. So let me write it out and I'll explain that again. I'm going to say in the force vector, element zero should look like F sub 0, the magnitude, or the amplitude of the forcing function, times cosine omega t. And the way we get to cosine is using NumPy. NumPy has a cosine function, and this should just be omega times time. So the force at that particular time, or that time step, is just equal to F naught times cosine omega times t. And by setting it equal to the zeroth index of the f vector, I'm in effect adding it to this array. If I now looked at f, it would show this value is non-zero. All right, and now we're going to increment the time by 1 by plugging this into the formula. Again, we derived this in the last video. And that just looks like y equals y plus delta t, our time step, times the inverse of matrix A. Only in order to use the inverse function, we need to first import it. So that comes from numpy.linear algebra, and we're going to import inverse. 
and now with that I can use it down here. And this is dot f minus b dot. Let me just write this out and I explain it why. Okay, so first of all, because b is a numpy object, I can use this dot operator on it, and the dot operator is just a multiplication, as you would multiply a vector with a matrix or a vector by a vector. It's exactly what you think it should be. But instead of saying b multiplied by y, I actually specify that it's multiplied in the dot sense. Uh, and I did the same thing here. The inverse of a multiplied by this, it's multiplied in the dot sense. I left an extra space here just to make it clear, but this is exactly the formula from our previous video where we're taking this vector f, which has been updated because of this line here. We're subtracting that uh, from that the b matrix, which is defined up here, the product of the b matrix and the state vector y, multiplying all of that by the time step and then adding that to whatever the state vector was at the current time step to get the new state vector at time t plus 1. Okay, if any of this is confusing, I, I reference you to the previous video. And then that's really it that we want to do. But if I want to plot this, I actually want to track the state Y and also the forces. So what I'm going to do is up here I'm going to define capital Y. And this is just a list which will be a placeholder for each time step to store the value of Y, the state vector. And similarly, I'm going to call this just force, just to call it something different from f. But that will do the same thing where it stores all the value of f at each time step. And then in order to store that, I just need to go in here. I type in y dot append y. Oh, excuse me, y1. Remember that y has two values. The zeroth position, which is the first value, is the velocity x dot. But actually what I want is the position x, and that is the second element of y, which is why it has the one index, since it's zero-based indexing. All right, that's a mouthful, and I'm just going to do the same thing with the force. I'm going to append to that f, f sub zero it is. So I'm appending this force and the second component of the y ve uh, vector. That's what we're storing. And then that is it. Uh, if I'm going to plot the result down here, I would say, first of all, I want to just get my time. Um, I can do that easily by, <clears throat> I can do it pythonically just by writing the time is i for i in time. So what this does is it's created a list T uh, where I've, I've circled, I've cycled through each one of the elements, each one of the values in this time array up here, this list, and I've set it equal to t. So now what I want to do is I want to plot y, this capital Y, and force versus time. That's what I'm trying to do here. Let me just push this up a bit. All right, so uh, first thing I need to do is I need to implement or import, I should say, matplotlib. Um, and the way I do this is from matplotlib dot Pi plot. Whoops. Matplotlib.pi plot. Uh, actually, the way I'll do it is from matplotlib input pi import pi. Getting tongue twisted. From matplotlib input pi plot as plt. So now, if I just use plt, I can reference pi plot. And that's exactly what I'm going to do down here. The first thing I want to do is plt. I'm going to use the plot function to plot t versus y. Similarly, I'm going to plot the force or t versus the force. Um, and then what I want to do is plt.show. And that shows the actual chart. And I would say I'm pretty much done. I'm just going to add a few details here. Uh, let's put grid lines. PLT grid is true. It'll give us grid lines on our chart. And also a legend, PLT.legend. And the way the legend works is the first thing I need to do is give it a list of what the, the names are. So it's displacement and force. And then I want to say where it's located. So location equals, oh, and we'll put it in the lower right. 
Field T dot show. And then I guess just for good measure, I want to print some of the system values. Print uh, critical damping. And for that, I'm going to use square root. I can get that from NumPy. So NumPy times square root times it's that part in the parentheses. I'm just going to write it. Uh, the part under the square root sign, rather, when we were deriving all of this. It's minus c squared plus 4m k um, see, I'm missing some parentheses here. Divided by 2 times m. Sure, it's all in floats. Okay, so all I've done is I've said, just for my own information, what is the critical damping constant? How much is it? And I also think I'll print the natural frequency. We know the natural frequency is the square root of k divided by m. Okay, so this looks just about ready to go. Um, uh, I want to implement at this point the check for the time step as well, which we had uh, dealt with at the end of the last video, and that is by applying the kinetic and potential energies, or, or, or finding the kinetic and potential energy of the system and having a look at that. So, what is the easiest way to add this? Um, hmm. I think what we'll do is do it in the time stepping solution. <coughs> Excuse me. So down here, I'm going to just calculate the kinetic and potential energy. So we'll call kinetic energy is equal to, well, it's a half m times the velocity squared. So it's 0 0.5 times the mass times the velocity squared, which the velocity is from vector y. It's the first component, y sub 0. I left out a multiplies here. And these are all scalars, so I don't need dot or anything like that. So it's 1 half times m times v squared. Similarly, the potential energy is 1 half times k times x squared. So this would be the second value in the y vector, x squared. And then I'm going to say print energy... Uh, Ke plus Pe. So just the total energy. And so that this doesn't get unwieldy, let's not print it every single step. Let's do the following. Um, if T... Uh, let's just say if T mod 1 is less than or equal to 0 0.00... .00 1, then we'll print this. And this is just a cute way of saying, don't print it every single cycle. Um, just print it every so often, fundamentally. So <coughs> let me run this, and let's see what this looks like. OK, so let's run this. Hopefully, there's no debugging to be done. Whoops, that should be an if t, not an it t. That's a lousy error. Uh, critical damping invalid syntax. This should be a times, four times m times k. All right, is it going to run now? There we go. Okay, so before I start, I just realized that I want to set my force back to zero. We first want to look at the free vibration problem and with zero damping. So this is just a simple mass spring system with no external load. Uh, I'm going to give it an initial displacement one, which I've got here on line 16, and then run it. And here's what we get. Let me pull the chart on here. 
And uh, if you're surprised to see that your peaks are growing, well, <laughs> this is the purpose of this demonstration. Um, we know that if I leave this thing go at a position of x equals 1, it should just oscillate between plus and minus 1. But we look at the amplitudes growing here. Why is this happening? Well, if I close this and we look back at the total energy, we see that the total energy is growing. It started at 1.01, .01 and it's grown since then. Um, well, why is it growing? It's growing because our integrator is not correct. In other words, it's not stable. The instability of our result is due to the instability of the integrator, which is due to the fact that I've used a delta t that's just too big. Okay, So I want to reduce my delta t until I'm happy with the fact that the system is not gaining too much energy. So what happens if I divide by 10 and make delta t 1 one hundredth of a second? Let me run that. And we still see that it's gaining energy, but it seems to be a lot better because it's gone from 1.0 to 1.2. And if I look at the chart that was output, we still see that our peaks are growing each oscillation, but not nearly as much as it was before. All right, so let's try this one more time. We'll divide again by 10, the time step. So we're now at 1 1,000th one of a second. And now that looks much better. We've gone from a starting point of 1.0. And our final point is 1.02. It's still gaining a bit of energy, but not nearly as much. And in fact, when we look at the chart, we see that it's pretty much oscillating between 1 and, and minus 1. You can make the argument that here on this final peak, it's gone slightly over. And truth is that it has. And you should get an idea from this that the time step to use is actually a function of the frequency and also how long you're running this out. If I'm only looking at the first two peaks, then I'm fine. If this was much higher frequency, uh, then perhaps within the space of these 20 seconds that I've simulated, we would see a lot more peaks and with each one it would grow. So I'm happy with this result in that uh, I think that our time step of 1 1,000th of a second is okay. And, um, you know, again, just to show you the result, well, we've got something that's oscillating between 0 and 1, uh, zero, between 1 and minus 1, I should say. The green line down at the bottom is the force, which is 0 for all time. We've set that equal to 0. Why? Because in line um, 10, we've set the amplitude of the force equal to 0. So let's run a couple of other things. Um, what if instead we made the velocity 1 and the displacement 0 initially, and I ran that? So now it should be a similar chart, only it's starting at zero displacement, where the last one started at this, uh, uh, up here. The, re the result, in other words, is a sinusoid as opposed to a cosine response. Okay, well, very interesting. What if, and by the way, we see at the bottom here that our natural frequency is one and our critical damping is two. So bearing that in mind, what if we, um, let's go back to the initial displacement being one. And what happens if we make our damping 2? And I made some mistake down here. The critical damping <laughs> Anyway, so if I put the damping in as 1, then we know that the system is underdamped, but it does have some damping. Let's have a look at that and see if that caters to our understanding. And, and there you have that. We initially let this go at a displacement of 1. And it does oscillate a little bit. But with each oscillation, if you link these peaks, if you drew a dotted line, you would see that the, the amplitudes are dying exponentially. Um, so if the critical damping is 4, like we said, 2 root mk, what if we... Uh, we set this equal to 4. We ran it. We'd expect it to come down to 0 very, very quickly, as quickly as possible, in other words. We do that, and, and sure enough, that's what's happened. There's no overshoot at all, and by 10 seconds, the displacement is 0. Well, what happens if we apply more damping? Surely more damping will bring it down to 0 quicker than 10 seconds? Not according to the theory. So what if we put the damping at 6, which is beyond? It's an uh, overdamped system now. We run this, 
and we find actually because there's so much damping, it doesn't get down to zero at 10 seconds. It's actually more like 15, 16 seconds that it gets down to zero. So that's interesting. Well, if the natural frequency is 1 and omega is 1, then I should be able to oscillate it at its natural frequency and cause resonance. So let's put no damping in here. Let's uh, say that the amplitude is 1. We've already said omega is 1, which we know from down below is equal to the natural frequency. And now I'm going to run it. Now, I'm not so worried that the energy is growing. It should grow because we're doing external work. But now what happens to our response? Well, our response is actually growing linearly. might not look like that's linear, but it's linear growth. We've showed in a previous video, and the link is up here, that we expect when we, we uh, oscillate the system at its resonant frequency, we expect the amplitudes of each successive oscillation to grow linearly. Um, and this kind of shows us the relationship between the force in green and the displacement in blue. And the idea here is that both have the same frequency. When the force and the, the, the uh, system are oscillating at the same frequency, we get resonance. I'm going to run this out just a little bit longer. So instead of 20 seconds, let's just run this out to 60 seconds. Because that should give you a better idea of whether the amplitudes are growing linearly or exponentially. We expect to see it linear. That's what we should, should happen mathematically. When we run that, hopefully it becomes a little bit more apparent if you put a straight edge across the top of these peaks that it will all line up. All right. And finally, what happens if I want to do a full-blown test where I'm going to put a little bit of damping in here. We'll call this one. Um, and I want to oscillate it now, use the forcing function. I want to run it for 60 seconds. Um, or maybe 40 seconds, but I'd like the forcing function only to be turned on for the first 15 seconds. So after 15 seconds, force should be equal to zero. So I'm going to go here where I've implemented the force, and I'm going to say, um, let's see the best way to do this. If, if t is less than equal to, oh, that's a typo, if t is less than equal to 15, then this function should apply. I keep misspelling if. should be if, not it. And then I'm going to put an else condition here. So if it's greater than 15, then f sub 0 is just equal to 0. So what happens is as the time gets to 15, I'm turning the force back to 0. Before that time, it's going to be growing because we're oscillating it at its natural frequency. And then the damping should kick in and die out and cause the oscillations to die out. So as a final test, I'm going to run this. And there we have it. So the first thing you should be seeing is that the force F after 15 seconds just goes to zero. Um, oh, I started this as an initial value problem. So let me just rerun this, but I'm going to make the initial value zero instead of one over here. So both the displacement and the velocity are zero initially. <clears throat> Let's run it again. There we go. Oops. All right, so the displacement starts at zero. It starts growing and growing because we're oscillating at its resonant frequency. And then at some point, we kill the force. It goes down to zero. And then because of the damping, it's an underdamped case, these oscillations die out in time back down to zero. That gives you a very good simulator of something that would actually be hard to solve mathematically, even for the single degree of freedom case. Anyway, that's all I want to talk and say about this video. Um, Certainly, you now have a methodology for implementing a solution. You've got the code snippets, and uh, this code will be made available on GitHub. I'll put a link to it down below. Um, but you should now at least be able to use it to convince yourself that certain things you come up with mathematically are correct because you can simulate it and look at the results. So that said, I hope you found something interesting in this video. We were able to encode this just in it was about 50 lines or so, so not very long. I'll make it a bit smaller here. You can see the extent of it. 
just over 50 lines of code. Um, if you found something useful in this video, I'd really like to hear from you in the comments below or go ahead and give it a thumbs up so that others can get to see this video too. Or better still, why don't you subscribe to our channel and you'll be, you'll be notified of all future video releases. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch up with you in the next video.